Good afternoon, everyone. Craig Simpson from Radiant Creators and myself just did a full two-hour interview. I know you're going to like the content of it. It's more on the vibrational frequency side of things in addition to getting your mind, body, and spirit ready for the changes in the Grand Solar Minimum. All the links are in the description box below for Radiant Creators, not only the podcast, the YouTube channel, and the website. So this is going to be part one through four. I'm going to cut it up so wherever you are in the series, I'll leave the links in the screens at the end. So you can go ahead and just click and jump through part one, two, three, four. I'll leave up the full interview in case you want to view it that way and also look for the podcast coming out. And again, everything is in the description box for all the links that you'll need, including social media and a way to get a hold of Craig after the interview. Is that related to the Iron Age you're talking about? I mean, is that governments losing control? Because it seems like, like, what are they doing? I'm not even sure how you pose the question. And I mean, what are the governments doing? They're letting people drown. They're giving us this con. And what the hell's going on? <laughs> well, I'll start with the, the, they're trying to not mass panic everybody into creating a situation years before the real difficulties come where they're going to need the police state in place. So the convenient excuse to put the police state in place was 9-11. They needed some great excuse to do it because if they would have done it without 9-11, there'd be an enormous amount of people asking questions like, hey, what's going on? No, we don't need this police state. But now after 9-11, it was just so perfect uh, to put it all in place. Now you need to understand why there are cameras everywhere. Why is everything being monitored and why is everything being so watched? Well, I just think they're trying to preemptively get ready for when they really need to control the citizens across the planet in terms of uh, food distribution, riots, etc. But one thing I do want to point out is America lost 38% of all of its stored grain. You understand that, right? 38% of the stored grain in the United States is unusable at the moment due to the flooding. I can't believe that didn't make more of the news. But now what the USDA did so quickly because the corn futures were spiking, they quickly came out and said, oh, oh, all the area acreage of soya beans, we're going to just quickly replant. So there's a new 4% of all American area that's growing soya beans is going to be converted to corn this year. So right away, the forecast going out is showing more corn being grown because of the conversion from the soya bean growing areas. But in reality, it doesn't work that quick. As far as I know, it takes two seasons to get a full crop in from when they start going. I mean, the soils are still ridden with roots, etc., and the herbicides and pesticides targeted for that particular plant. You can't tell me that what you're putting to grow soy and beans is a target in terms of, uh, say, fertilizers, herbicides and pesticides, fungicides, is exactly the same as it is for corn. No way! It's going to take a little bit of time to convert over those exact acreage for grow. And those massive facilities down the Mississippi River those pumps didn't work to end. They were inundated. That water came over, you know, seven, eight feet above the levees over these last couple of weeks. Those pumps were inefficient. You got an entire Mississippi River flooding into an inland delta all the way up to Missouri and Nebraska turning into an inland sea and Iowa's an inland sea slowly draining. You got hundreds of trillions of gallons of water coming down the rivers, overflowing everything and not a peep on the news. They're just trying to stabilize grain markets and not panic. Again, it all comes back to wiser censorship. It's to avoid mass panic. Because you have to realize, you got to, as a government, please walk through me with the mind experiment, everybody listening out there. I'm going to put you in charge of being the government. You are it. We're going to, you, you rule the world right now. Anything you say goes for the entire planet. I'll, I'll give you this power for a minute. You have two choices, A or B. You can tell the average citizen, as much as I know, you can put it on the news every night with the front page newspaper blast it. You can throw it on every network, grand solar minimum, food shortages, you need to prepare, you need to do your own, you need to help, you need to do this. Or I can keep everybody completely in the dark and I can allow my government to continue continuity and getting ready, buying all the supplies that the citizens will be buying, stockpiling for my government with my arms, guns, ammunition, supplies, food rations, medicine, machinery, repair parts, backup generators, repair parts for the backups to the backups, all the while you are not buying. So what would you do? Because you know by telling everybody what's going to happen, it would create mass panic. I mean, literally, people would check out. There's going to be mass suicides. People just not going to want to deal with this. And oh my gosh, you're going to have to rely on myself? 
I'm going to have to take culpability for my own actions. And be, no, I want government to do that for me. We've gotten to this most lazy society. And then if you don't, if I'm calling people out for being the most laziest of the laziest, wanting the free handouts and don't want to do anything, hey, don't bag me for it. Why should I be criticized or, or mulled through the internet for pointing out just the, the workings of everyday society and the truth? The obvious. I'm pointing out the obvious. People just are too lazy today to want to take, take responsibility. And boy, if they told them they would have to be on their own and take their own responsibility, whoo, I don't think that we'd be, our societies would collapse years before the real uh, trauma or the real cataclysms or the real changes in our society is coming. I think it would just fall apart within weeks if the truth was truly known. So if you want to know why the censorship's there, that's why it's there. Yeah, and it seems like we've got a, I guess I'm 49, so I'm not that old, but I would say people that I know who are older, and certainly not all millennials, uh, but and, and people, youngsters younger than them, uh, having lived in the city of Seattle for a good number of years and such, I find that we do have a younger generation, but it's not this younger generation, it's people my age also that really want their enslavement. I mean, it, it is an odd thing, but if you go to cities where basically they breed people who are easy to control, that's what I think cities are for. I know Plato said the greatness of a civilization is found in the cities. I would say not so much as the degeneration of a, of a people is found. Maybe it depends on what time in history you're, you're looking at a city. But I think one thing that we face as a challenge is people who would trade a prison cell for f certainty of health care and food and free Wi-Fi with an iPad. I mean, it's a unique time where I see, it just, just does seem like there are people who really, they savor and they coddle their weakness and a desire quite literally just to be taken care of, but more than be taken care of, they're willing slaves. So it's, it is quite the time to have a grand solar minimum where it's not just the person might not be ready mentally or physically or spiritually. The, those are different aspects. It seems that I'm not sure if a lot of humanity, at least what I see in cities right now, has a desire to fight for their own sovereignty really for their own lives because they're fighting for the opposite right now. So it seems like there might be some people who are waking up intuitively to it, but it seems like there are some people, maybe they're waking up to it intuitively, but they're hiding under a pillow or something. I think that people who sort of changes their position until their back's against the wall and there's some kind of duress state, then they change. Now, you go back through these, you know, esoteric traditions, Saturn cult, Big Dipper cult over here in China, the Big Do Qi Xing. And anywhere you look across, you know, through prehistory, there's always seems to be this one segment of society that's responsible. I personally don't believe it. I'm responsible for my own uh, evolution, if you will. But, you know, in the traditions that are put forth and what you understand of uh, esoteric meaning, these level of persons are in charge of creating such stress here that we need to jump evolution, that we won't do it on our own, that because we won't do it on our own, that gives them the right to put us through all this barbarism to try to make us spiritually evolve. Well, for me, it makes no sense, but at least that's the way the traditional story goes. And again, I think that's just a smoke and mirrors to allow them to try to continue to reign control. So even if you see something negative, you're like, oh, well, they're just trying to help humanity, you know, evolve spiritually. Uh, I think it's still part of that darkness that's around, that's been uh, allowed to maybe jump dimension during the lowest times of vibration, the two dimensions sort of intersync on each other. And I think that split is happening again, where they're starting to uncouple as the vibrational frequency increases. But change doesn't really come. You know, you look through history, changes don't really occur until there's massive, massive suffering. You know, the greatest leaps in technology only occur when there's no other choice. Absolutely, you're going to die or you're going to change. And it seems like that's when the changes in our societies in terms of, you know, science, evolution, um, you know, adaptation, different ways, methods to do something come. 
But until that time, everybody's so happy and so content being like sheep, you know, just sit there, take care of you like a house pet somewhere and you're super happy with that. You got warmth, somebody's petting you all day long, free food, whatever. People don't want to rock the boat. And that's one of the things in China too, is you look at the internet censorship and you look at the government control and you got the internment camps over there and everybody's monitored and the social credit score and it's just a living prison over there. But everybody's lives are getting better. So if you're getting better food, better health care, better electricity, more stable, you know, workings of your life, you got roads, cars, transportation, the lives are actually getting better in China for the average person. That's why nobody wants to rock the boat over there, because what they've seen during the Mao Zedong era with the Cultural Revolution, you know, the Great Leap Forward with 45 million people starving to death, nothing working, everything dirt roads into this massive new upbuild where, man, we got full cities, we got apartments, electricity. I don't want to go away from that and go start living back in a, in a mud hut with no electricity again. So what the, what the Chinese government has done is done the exact same thing the American governments and many governments, European, whatever. They've given everybody comfort so they don't question the government and they don't want change in leadership because comfort means inaction. So what's going to happen is there's going to be a lot of non-comfort coming up. So this is the reason I believe the police state has been built up over these last couple of decades is because when people do get angry and hungry people are angry people. What's that Bob Marley song? Hungry mobs are angry mobs, right? There's going to be massive change so quickly that it's going to shake your, you're going to, your mind is going to spin how fast the average placid citizen is going to become a morbid like animal that's non-human to go to be able to eat. Like if, they're if it's a choice for their family eating and for them to kill you for that food, they're going to kill you. There's no question about it. Their families are coming first. If they have to fist fight you to get that food or they need to pull a knife out or a weapon to get that food versus you going to get and their family's not starving, you got to realize this is where we're coming to. And I really believe that's why a lot of the police state is out there. But, but caveat before I finish my statement, the vibrational frequency which you exist in is gonna be a huge part of this because you can vibrate at a certain level and those types of energies won't really be at you versus if you're vibrating at a lower level where you're always angry, you're always looking for violence, there's always trouble, you're always living in this lack and scarcity and need and fight kind of mentality. If you're in that vibrational frequency, you're gonna have difficulty every day on the streets if you're in a higher vibrational frequency, literally with your mind, this comes back into the gratitude, the way you're vibrating, you know, it's going to be a completely different ball game. Because I think with the changes, um, you know, electrically on our sun, it, it is even going to take it up a couple steps of being able to manifest in this physical reality a bit faster than we are now or even have been able to. So keep in mind, your mind is going to be one of the most important things moving forward in terms of the way you can morph and change and bend to situations, but the way you need to use it to think, to stay at a higher level of vibration and kind of this love light where you're not out to hurt people. You're only thinking about helping people. You're only wanting to be associated with people who are gonna help you survive. The, you know, when I go traveling, I always think about setting my mind before I go travel of the people I wanna meet the experiences I wanna have. And I do that for my daily life too. I just don't wake up and go, oh, I'm gonna go to the streets today. I think about safety, you know, meeting the right people. Every time I meet somebody, it's to, to help uplift myself and give myself greater knowledge so I can help more people move through these times. You know, it's about the way you use your mind to live in this reality. So please, the mind will help you with the physical stuff later on. And I'll stop there. <laughs> no, I think that's very good because I know as you have an attitude of gratitude as you work on yourself spiritually. I'm not sure how else to, to say it. I mean, ultimately, it's mentally, physically, and spiritually. But yeah, we are manifesting, at least I can attest to myself and others that I know, that at this time, now, if a person doesn't you know, jive with this, it's okay. But if you don't, you're probably not listening, so I'm not going to worry about it. We are manifesting way quicker than we used to. And we're getting better at it and getting more confidence in it. And truly, um, like I remember once I was in a quite a car accident. It was a nasty car accident. But when I saw it coming, which I really didn't have time to see it coming, let's just say that I knew it was going to happen. But in that moment, it was like I radiated out from myself. 
I went, I'm going to be all right. And I walked out with just a broken nose and some uh, really rough abrasions on my forearms from the airbag. And I actually tore the seatbelt out of the floor of the car. You know, I, that's how intense the, it was. And I just walked out, walked away from it. And I've always believed that it was because I broadcasted that intention right as I knew it was going to happen. I just went, I'm going to be all right. And it was an absolute certainty. And I walked away from just devastation. <laughs> and I was fine. So really, even through this, um, I'd say it's knowing you're going to be all right, but also, hey, look, everybody dies. Maybe you will. I mean, ultimately, that's the end for all of us. So don't don't sweat it, whether it's now or in 10 years or 50. It's, it's inevitable anyway. But while you're alive, you can thrive, and you can thrive right through this, this uh, uh, solar minimum, and you can have a good time through it. I mean, really... You can enjoy, I, I do believe this, seeing the beauty of humanity and how it comes together, or you can see the disaster that's going to happen also. But it's all about really what frequency you're tuned into. So I, I would say that really how, how you experience this is truly 100% up to you. I agree. You know, staying on the frequency into things, look at a place called Fiend by N-B-H-O-R-N. I put their energy into the plants vibrationally, and I tell you what, the yields that they have coming out, there's no other explanation for it than their consciousness projected onto those plants is causing those plants to grow larger. So, you know, we need to get back into, like I say, you need to think so far out of the box that you're not in a box, where we are so locked in to your plants can only yield this much. They don't even teach us about using granite dust to try to boost yields. Uh, there's so many other little types of physical things we can do to boost yields. How about putting the seeds in your mouth to get the saliva there so it, get, it understands your DNA so it grows for you particularly? How about talking to the plants? You know, there's a lot of people who get really good yields. I know some uh, growers that uh, they went in, you know, some bud growers, and they went in and prayed on the plants, and they come out with some of the most incredible strains you've ever seen with such clarity of, like, instant connection to the God realms on what they produced outside where their yields came in. And beyond what you think is possible physically, there's this new element that you just spoke about, this manifestation element that is allowing us, I think this might be part of it, to allow you to boost up whatever it is, awareness, yields, safety, love, etc. during these times of duress. But can you imagine if you can double your plant yield just by going in and focusing on the plants for 15 minutes a day with a group of people? Like those plants are going to grow specifically for your group and how you can, you know, start using, uh, how about using sound vibrations? You know, I don't know if anybody's familiar with Organite. But if you take Organite, you put a sound cone in into it around that copper coil, then you can use something off your computer to put specific vibration on hertz frequencies into the coil. I built a few of those myself. So you can run it at like 528 or you can run it at 10,000. Uh, different types of frequencies you can run into the Organite to vibrate the crystals to get them to point to a different uh, you know, level of vibration. You can really feel it fill the air too when you're vibrating it through through a sound program to target that crystal to make it spin or, or vibrate at a certain level. You know, we should be experimenting with this for plant growing and different oh, vibration sounds for plants. There's definitely. so many experiments that we could be running that are just mainstream science says that's mumbo jumbo, but it's not. And you can do it in your own life. So if you have your vertical garden growing in your kitchen, if you've got your microgreens going, if you've got your garden outside going, you can go and do uh, Qigong out there in your garden and you can see how it affects your plants because when when we do it in the house the whole house's energy just changes i mean you can feel it and it and it lasts for a while it's like daily qigong in the house literally changes the house's energy you know and yeah go and talk to your plants i mean there's an amazing series of books uh, the uh, secret life of plants secrets of mm, the soil then the secret life of na of nature i believe which really is the most eclectic of all three of them um, but just secret life of plants and secrets of the soil and a lot of what we're talking about is spoken of there just unique um, like biodynamic farming I mean uh, and then yeah people praying to the plants and so 
Yeah, a lot more is possible than we think, and you you truly learn by doing. So I think people would be amazed at how their lives changed for the better, how they were thriving, how much more confidence they would have if they start growing a garden indoors. You know, you just start growing. I and I and that's what I really wish for people because I think that regardless of what the future may hold, what I think is most important is that you thrive today. And I just don't think you can thrive without growing some of your own food, without having also, what do you think of just a connection to nature? Because it seems like if you live in a city, uh, you're, it's not so easy. But if you live rural at all, um, get out and experience nature. Like how many people really know what happens in nature near them as the seasons change? It seems like I have a feeling in the grand solar minimum that we all might get closer closer to nature and uh, do you hunt and gather in your area do you know what you can hunt and gather in your area and do you have a relationship to nature because because do you think a person can literally start to start spending time in nature cultivate that relationship and then nature will help support them in that situation because they appreciate it. Like, I don't think nature is seen by enough of us. Yeah, so a couple things there. Yes, I do natural forage. I've taken a couple, I wouldn't say courses, I've had some people go out with me around. We did two different types of, uh, actually three. One was just in the city, like walking around where they're gonna be building buildings to look to see, you know, things like nettles. Those are so easy to find. Um, different, it looks, uh, there's a kind of green plant out here. Uh, look, you can, it looks like a really dark green leafy vegetable. Um, just things that look like food naturally. When you look at it intuitively, it looks like food. You can natural forage around a city if you know exactly what you're looking for. Something that would be almost like a spinach or a lettuce that just grows. But you might have to cook it once and then drain the water and then cook it again. Flash it, cook it again. But, you know, nobody wants to go to the trouble to do that. You can just go to the supermarket and buy something you don't only have to prepare once. Another time, uh, going further out in the forest, yes, I know nine different ones here that are highly nutritious, a couple types of root bulbs out here that you can forage for naturally, uh, fruits, all kinds of fruits and stuff. I know the berries to stay away from. Actually, I got really sick one time. There's not sick, but there's two types of taro. This is my personal experience. You got to learn. Once you learn once, you'll never do it again. There's two types of taro. One is the type that you can eat that has the, they look exactly the same, except for the leaf is slightly different. So even after you dig it up, the root bulbs look exactly the same. One of them, when it's laying like this, the water uh, pools in the leaf. The other one, the water just drains off. So the one the water drains off is the one you don't want. Uh, I cooked that one up and, and I bit it. And as soon as I bit it, uh, it was like eating itchy sandpaper. And I couldn't even swallow. By the time I spit it out, it was already going down my throat. And it made me, uh, I couldn't swallow. I felt like I was swallowing you know, cotton ball filled sandpaper for two to three hours. And then uh, I broke out everywhere about three or four hours later. You couldn't even swallow one bite of that. It was that bad tarot. So anyway, learn the local plants around your area. Learn the ones that you can easily eat or forage. And what the Native American Indians did so well, you talked about creating nature around you, was when they found an area that something grew really well. So this is, I'll use the example of blueberries because they're highly nutritious and they're, they're delicious. So what they found is an area that a blueberry plant was growing, they would clear the underbrush around that was stifling the blueberry growth so the blueberry could spread naturally on its own. So if you're walking around in your home forest or somewhere in your backyard or neighborhood forest, go out and see what's growing there naturally. Definitely, and that reminds me of fellowship. I mean, it, it does seem that something essential is to, if, if it is possible, to gather with a fellowship of people who are thinking along the same lines. I mean, it's odd. Now, when we speak of the uh, intuition speaking to us, it was not that long ago before prepping was a very underground kind of thing. It, it wasn't on the forefront. Now you go to uh, you know, Barnes and Nobles or you go to even a supermarket and you'll see several magazines just on prepping and homesteading and such. So it's, it's in the consciousness. And it does seem that uh, fellowship, you know, having hopefully where you live, if you are connected with a group of people who are thinking along the same lines and planning for the same things, it gives you an incredible 
incredible advantage. I mean, I think community and fellowship is one of the, you know, greatest advantages that we can possibly have. Yeah, it is because you need those like-minded people that, at least in the beginning, they're with you on the uh, the changes that are coming. Everybody's seeing forward how the society might move. But you, you also pointed out a very important part there: the just overall knowledge. Do you think that got there on purpose? Do you think those magazine covers that you're seeing about preparedness and homesteading are out on those front rows on purpose, or do you think they just organically arrived there? I think our governments are telling us what's coming in a very, very subtle way for those who are aware and at least open enough to get the message. I mean, you watch Game of Thrones. Are you kidding me? Winter is coming. Everywhere you look across popular society, zombie apocalypse. That's going to be the starving hordes of people walking around. Wherever you look, it's around us. And I will say one last thing with that. You talk about Ocasio-Cortez saying, oh, there's only 12 years left before, you know, the world is going to end because of global warming. Well, if we switch that over to grand solar minimum, it's pretty much on the timeline when Valentina Zarkova says the global food shortages will be here. And we're talking about a global famine for years. There won't be another country to come and rescue you either. You're truly going to be on your own. You're truly going to have to take care of yourself in a homesteading fashion. It'll get better in the future, another generation from now. But in this interim, you know, don't expect somebody to come and, you know, deliver food to your door like a government's not going to do that. We, we're going to have a difficult enough time keeping continuity of government and economy in our own nations, let alone relying on other people to come in and donate food to us. This is going to be the biggest contentious issue in trade deals moving forward is going to be the availability of food. And you look at Russia already, they're cutting off their supplies export wise. Start to do the math. Australia is going into a mega drought that's supposed to last for another five to seven years. So their exports are going to go to zero. They're going to become an importing nation. South Africa is going completely offline due to politics. Decreases in the U.S., decreases in Canada, decreases in China. Look at China all across the board this year. Decrease, decrease, decrease. How many more decreases can we take before the world wakes up and goes, oh, we have been losing food production for the last two years. I wonder what it'll be like next year and the year after. Because the trend is, if it's happening three years in a row, that's probably not going to reverse the trend and go back to bountiful crops where there's an overage of a gain of 2%. With all the GMOs and all the massive new technologies, why are we not increasing food capacity globally? Why has it been decreasing in the last two years? These are the kind of questions that the the corporate media is not asking. I don't know why they're not talking about this. But, uh, you know, the culturally around you, look, the signs are all around you. They're giving you the subtle warning. Perhaps you should heed it. I think what you say with Game of Thrones is really amazing. Winter is coming, you know, and that I've not followed that series too much. But from what I have followed, yeah, there's a lot of correlations you can get into, you know. Um, kingdoms fighting for power. Uh, there's a great line where, you know, uh, do you think being king gives you power? You know, it's, it's amazing, a lot of this stuff. And there's the people who live on the outskirts, the fringe dwellers of society that are doing fine and always have been doing fine while civilizations come and go. So it's really something. Yeah, it's, it, it's definitely a different way of looking at it. I mean, winter is coming. That's the whole notion of Game of Thrones. Wow. Yeah. So there's something in the collective consciousness. Well, something I'm reminded of is, like I was in Somalia. I was in the military when I was a youngster and I was in Somalia. And I've always felt that that had some it was a very meaningful coincidence. It was like, like it wasn't a coincidence. And what I saw there was a society disintegrate. It's a little hard to compare Somalia to like Western culture and, and Western uh, lifestyle and architecture and utilities. I mean, it was not a first world country in the first place, you know, at least as far as I could tell. But what I saw was a people who did have um, security there was police, they had ambulances, they had running water, they had electricity, um, vehicles. But overnight, after the Civil War started, they had none of that. It was gone. And there was no law. There was just sort of feudal kingdoms that arose, different, you know, basically, you know, large gangs owned different parts of the city. 
and such. It was really a disaster. But what I saw happen was the good people outnumbered the bad people by far. And most people wanted to rebuild their culture. They wanted they wanted things to work again. They wanted ambulances. They wanted, like, you know, grandma's got diabetes. we got to find a way to get insulin. I mean, um, we need water, so we need to be able to find ways to get it. I mean, I was amazed at how from a culture that functioned, you know, a second world country, I can't quite call it a first world country, but in a matter of a few weeks, it became... A functional Stone Age society again. I mean, it's really odd. So I feel that I have this eerie feeling of kind of having some insight on what's going to happen, you know. And it always seems like, and some some of the things you said really reminded me of that. Um, <coughs> if you have your tribe, if you have your family and friends, if you have kind of a group that is conscious of what's coming, for one thing, it gives you people to talk to about you know, and shared knowledge and share what's working and what's not working growing food. And then also um, things that I saw make a huge difference in Somalia when it fell apart was you need your security. So you have your fellowship, your group of people, you have a security in that you need security of your neighborhood, security of yourself and your home. So live where you can do that. And then also it really came down to those who could grow stuff and sell it and those who could fix things and sell that they're the ones who did just fine and then as security was restored you had markets you know i mean quite literally all the stores and such were gone but you had people selling things they grew you had people who could sharpen knives you had people who could fix hydraulic equipment people who could fix generators i mean quite literally it was something to see and society has a natural organizing principle it society wants society to exist you know so that's just something that i definitely noticed and one thing that does get missed with all the prepping um it's great to be able to grow things great to be able to defend yourself it's good to be in shape and all of that but one thing i would really recommend to people is learn first aid and secondary aid and also you know, learn how to take care of trauma injuries and, I mean, all these things. It, it would not hurt everybody who has this mindset to learn how to be an EMT. I tell you, it's people who are mm -hmm. not going to have problems are EMTs. They're going to be protected by society because um, even if you pull those ambulance or <laughs> ambulances around with horses, you're going to need them and you're going to need those skills. Those people are going to be organizing, I think, a lot more than we might think. That's true, and that go back, goes back into the, the need for antibiotics or how to produce antibiotics. And if you're looking for more information on the Grand Solar Minimum, 30 minutes at a time, many Ice Age Conversations podcast, anywhere podcasts are hosted across the net. And I've also begun to upload on Minds.com. If you're over on Minds, subscribe to Adapt2030, and I'll keep a feed coming through with new information daily.